So good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining ACAN tonight for the second of this year's existing building groups case study webinars. For those unfamiliar with ACAN, I'm going to start with a short introduction into the organisation before we continue with the presentation from tonight's speaker. So ACAN exists to address the way our built environment is made, operated and renewed in response to the climate emergency. As a network of individuals, we channel personal energy, expertise and action towards a common goal, the systemic change of our profession and the construction industry as a whole. We see this as a matter of urgency. Our mission is to mobilise a new movement of professional activists towards this goal by building an open, supportive and inclusive organisation. ACAN empowers individuals to proactively seek change and facilitates collective effort through the shared platform built on collaboration. So ACAN has three overarching aims. We seek to radically transform the regulatory, economic and cultural landscape in which our built environment is made, operated and renewed in light of the global climate crisis. <clears throat> we, we advocate the immediate adaptation of, re of regenerative and ecological principles in order to green the built environment, prioritise communities and ecosystems at threat and promote the recovery and restoration of natural environments. We call for the complete remodelling of our professional culture and seek to create an open network to share resources and knowledge to aid this transition. We must challenge and redefine the value systems at the heart of our industry and education system. ACAN is an organisation powered by volunteers and operates without commercial affiliation. As we've grown, we've begun to incur some administrative costs. We'd like to make sure tickets for these kind of events are free. However, if you are able to make a small donation to keep us going, we won't be able to thank you enough. All donations will go towards future campaigns, events, or monthly overheads. And if you'd like to donate, we'll drop a link into the chat or up to our website where you can find out more information. So tonight we're going to be joined by existing building group regular, John Christophers, the designer and homeowner of Zero Carbon House. After architectural training in Nottingham, John joined Associated Architects and rose to director in the year 2000. John now works as a freelance consultant and focuses on the intersection between design and sustainability. In 2022, John contributed to the Retrofit Reimagined Festival in Birmingham, envisaging how domestic deep retrofit could be transformational as a community-led neighbourhood project, and is helping to lead this change within the local community group Retrofit Balsall Heath, which I believe John is also going to speak about tonight. So completed in 2009, Zero Carbon House was the UK's first zero carbon retrofit. The project saw the transformation of an end of terrace house into a groundbreaking family home using low energy materials and environmental systems. And it was the first UK retrofit house to achieve level six of the code for sustainable homes. Zero Carbon House was also the winner of various architectural awards, including the 2010 RIBA Award for, sustain, uh, for Architectural Excellence, the Retrofit Award 2010, and the shortlist for the Manson Medal uh, in 2011, amongst various other awards. So if anyone has any other questions throughout the presentation, please do drop them in the chat and we'll be finishing the event with a discussion where we hope John will be able to answer anything you may ask. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and, and pass over to John. That's great. Uh, I hope you can all hear me now. Uh, thank you very much for your, your warm introduction, George. Um, and um, uh, as George has said, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, um, the Zero Carbon House in Birmingham, where in fact I'm, I'm speaking, you from, speaking to you from tonight. Um, the Times uh, in London, uh, when it covered the house shortly after its, its completion, um, started the, um, the article with the, um, the quote which has uh, stuck in my mind, I've seen the future and it's in Birmingham. Now, as, as Brummies, we're not always used to the London, um, the London press getting what we're about in, in this city, but uh, we, 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 were, we were pleased for that. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's amazing to me that it's continued to, um, to, to have media coverage right up to um, uh, th th this. This was last year, the retrofit radicals piece in the Financial Times was, was coverage of, of the house, but also the, uh, the retrofit reimagined festival of, of which more are non. Um, but um, what's interesting about this house? Well, uh, th this, this is a piece of research from, from 2012 from uh, Professor Lubo Yankovic, uh, looking at the fact that the house was performing at um, zero carbon, and we'll unpack what that means, but net operational zero carbon over a year. 
uh, in, in terms of the operational carbon. But uh, he, he was so intrigued, he, he built a dynamic simulation model as part of a research thing. And uh, as, as part of that, he said, well, look, what if we take the environmental conditions of Rovaniemi up in the Arctic Circle in Finland and we drop the house uh, up there, it'll still be zero carbon uh, or better than zero carbon in, in the way that we were measuring it up there, um, it, which we thought was quite incredible. And uh, I just wanted to preface my remarks tonight with uh, just this one graphic extracted from Monday's IPCC report, which some of you may have looked at, um, and uh, some of you may not have had not have had a chance. But uh, Ed Hawkins, who who's famous at Reading University for the climate stripes, uh, has been one of the contributors, and I think this graphic particularly struck me. Uh, so I'll just spend a moment um, describing it. So on the left hand uh, uh, side, we have. Um, from the year 1900 up to 2020, 120 year span, with with what, what are now, I think, famously Ed Hawkins's stripes representing a different temperature uh, for each year. So that's the, the, the last 120 years. We can see how the warming has has, has gone. Um, and uh, the right hand side of the slide then shows the five different scenarios which the IPCC have, have habitually had in their reports. So uh, what happens if we do all the wrong things, what an intermediate um, scenario and then very low, what happens if we make all the right sort of decisions. And we can see even that it, it, in all those five scenarios, uh, the, the, the planet warms up quite considerably. Uh, but um, on the very high, high and intermediate, the warming then continues beyond 2100 and we get into very dangerous territory. And it's only with the, with the lower two scenarios or the lowest one of all, really, that we have any chance of, of uh, uh, staying, um, even if not completely below the 1.5 degree Paris target, at least mostly below it. But I think what's interesting here is... Um, uh, the graphics team have overlaid at the bottom different lifespans. So someone who was born in 1950 will be 70, year olds in, 70 years old in 2020. Someone born in 1980 will be 70 in 2050. Uh, and someone born just a couple of years ago in 2020 will be 70 years old in 2090. And I think as building professionals, we're, we're always, you know, I, I, I always say to people, we're, we're, we're not building for now, we're building for the next many decades. And I think this puts it in context that, you know, it'll be within living memory, uh, 2090, 2100 is really not that far away. Hence, I, I think as construction professionals, we have a huge responsibility to future generations to, uh, to get this right what we're what we're doing now uh, and um, many of you will be familiar that the climate change committee amongst others have highlighted that homes uh, is and retrofit of, of existing homes is, is one of the most important things we, uh, we can do uh, more than pays for itself through savings on fuel uh, and this quote, which is from just around the time Ukraine was taking off a year ago, recent events have shifted the calculus on this even further in favour of just taking decisive action now. So I think if anyone was in any uh, any quandary as to whether deep retrofit is worth it, I think uh, certainly with, with every doubling of, of fuel prices means that uh, the payback on a, a very deep retrofit halves uh, in, in all sorts of ways. So... Um, uh, with those opening remarks, I, I, I've got five sections to my um, talk to you tonight. The first is about the zero carbon house, and I'll take you on a little walk around it, show you show you what it feels like. Uh, secondly, uh, as I hope we've got many architects on the call uh, and um, technicians, technical people uh, to, to to describe how uh, how, how it has achieved the. Um, I think remarkable results beyond what we what we dared to hope that I've I've just shown you a glimpse of. Uh, thirdly, the monitoring and uh, research. Fourthly, how the, how it's all sort of come together into uh, a, a sort of um, a model of low carbon architecture. And uh, fifthly, I then want to um, talk a little bit about the work which has flowed from that in, in retrofit Balsall Heath in, in our local neighbourhood here. So uh, firstly, the house itself. Uh, th these are the credits. Um, I was designing it um, uh, 2007. We moved in uh, uh, completion 2009, which is 14 years ago now. 
Uh, and um, there were three aims, which um, which I defined really for myself as much as anything uh, in the planning design and access statement. Uh, the, the, the first was what was termed as true zero carbon by the Code for Sustainable Homes, which had come out uh, at that time. And I'll say a bit more about that, but uh, operational um, zero carbon, net zero carbon. But the second aim was to was to do that with a 170 year old building um, which is the, uh, the the red brick on on the right of this uh, th this photo here was the existing house and obviously the um the render and the um uh, the, the timber cladding is uh, is the uh, is is the new part there uh, so, so that was the the, the the second aim not only to do the zero carbon but to see how it could apply to uh, to a retrofit uh, and thirdly to use the, the the project to campaign and inspire uh, and uh, and develop those ideas further and so in in that sense it, it's helpful to be reminded by george of, of the ACAN aims about change and um, and uh, advocacy and, and so forth um, so um, the code for sustainable homes it's it's um, it, it, it's a historic document now but it was it, it had only just come out when I was uh, designing the house uh, and I think it's just worth recapping it, partly to to see what was current then but partly just just to um, reframe this through the lens of, of today uh, so the the, um, the first aim in the code for sustainable homes is is um, is, is based on carbon emissions very low carbon emissions and, and energy use uh, and lighting and so forth um, and uh, but then there are uh, eight other aims uh, around water usage materials surface water um, waste um, reduced pollution health and well-being management of the site which included site co2 um, and embodied carbon and that sort of thing uh, and site ecology so i think it's just worth reflecting firstly that the um uh, uh, the target of, of, of zero carbon, uh, net zero carbon, or, or true net zero carbon, as the Code for Sustainable Homes uh, defined it back in um, 2007, was really um, in contrast to the building regulations, which were not looking at the source of, of the energy um, at all, and only had uh, very limited, as, as they still do, very limited criteria. The Code for Sustainable Homes was, was looking at reducing down um, the energy which was needed in the house to, to such a point that uh, that energy could then be supplied on the site itself. Now, I think um, one can critique that from today's perspective to say, well, look, it may be more cost effective to say we should put more wind turbines in the North Sea or in, in a solar farm nearby or whatever than actually to do it on the site. And I think that's absolutely right and proper and, and fair to do that. And I, I think for the country as a whole, I think that's um, that's probably the sensible way to do things. Um, nevertheless, I think there is something very interesting in terms of communication about the fact that the, 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 um, the zero carbon house, as, as defined by the Code for Sustainable Homes, did generate an, uh, all its own energy on site. And that is because I think it gives the opportunity to describe the impact that buildings have on the environment. And I think if we take the Letty figure, figures, 49% of UK CO2 emissions come from buildings uh, and buildings. So that's the um, uh, both the building industry construction and the embodied carbon going into buildings, the operation of buildings, uh, of which um, domestic homes are a huge part, uh, but also the parts of transport and industry and other sectors, which are sometimes measured in different way, which actually come into um, construction. So all those lorries you see on the motorways or, or whatever, uh, burning carbon to supply the building industry can be put into transport or they can be put into building industry. So there's a huge chunk of, of carbon which, um, which the building industry is responsible for. And I think if we look at the idea of a house um, or any building which uh, instead of being a consumer of resource actually becomes a little generator of resource i think we found over the years that's a very powerful concept which communicates to people uh, how radically one needs to um, one needs to turn 
turn the culture and, and the, all these systemic issues around climate around. So I don't apologize in any way that the code that the code for sustainable homes sort of encouraged us to generate the energy that we need on the site, even if we see that now through the lens that that is not necessarily the right answer for, for every site. Uh, so we achieved the um, code for sustainable homes level six, as it was called, um, uh, and uh, those are the figures to, to show it. Um, this is the site before we started work. Um, on, on the right is the existing house, uh, which we think is circa 1840, uh, and was one of a, uh, perhaps a terrace of houses which was going to be built, but was never, never extended. So the yellow arrow shows the, the full extent of, of, of the site. Um, there was just a vacant, uh, a vacant plot there before. Um, this is looking from uh, from up the road a little bit. You can see in the centre of the shot there that the zero carbon house just above the uh, the red car. Um, the view back to the city centre, the, the Victorian school just opposite on on the right of the slide. There, um, this is this is the site um, uh, on the left without the new extension, and on the right uh, with the new build added. Note the ash trees, large ash trees, just at the rear of the site. Um, and uh, so those in, in red are the two buildings circa 1840, which were um, terraced houses, in fact, semi-detached houses, because the rest of the terrace was never built. And here is the plan showing how the zero carbon house sort of grows out of this um, to, to, to the left, particularly. So uh, if we walk around from the red arrow at the bottom, we come into a sort of curved hallway. Uh, and um, garage on, on the left. We go through at the back of the plan to the kitchen and dining, which look out. Um, the blue um, um, freeform sort of shape at, at the rear of the house is actually a sun space, a conservatory space, which we've never built. Um, when I was uh, designing this bed Z had uh, was the sort of most recent high profile scheme which had been um, which had been completed and relied on the sun spaces uh, those who are familiar with with that scheme uh, to stop the heat loss at, at the back of the house we found that um, although the uh, although the sun space I think is a very strong idea and I, I would do it again um, we, we never did it on this for a number of reasons. One is that the house has performed very well without it. Uh, another is cost, that, 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 uh, that there was quite a lot of money to, to do that, but um, we don't really need the, the, the extra space. So I think at the time I was designing it, the um, PHPP software was only just becoming to be used in this country and no one had done a, a scheme which was certified to passive house level in this country at all. Uh, the, the data for modelling wasn't available to see what impact the sun space would have. And so partly I thought, well, let's build it without the sun space uh, and let's see how it performs. And then we will uh, monitor it and add the sun space and we'll, we'll provide some data which was not available to me to, to sort of um, assess the design at that stage. Uh, in fact, we've, uh, we've failed to contribute to research in the sense that we haven't, uh, we, we, we haven't needed to build the sun space. So I can't tell you what the difference is uh, with, um, with and without it. Uh, if we go up then to the uh, to, to the first floor, we've got, uh, which is the left hand slide here, uh, we've got four bedrooms um, at the four corners of the plan there, um, a, um, a, a shower room on the left, uh, a bathroom at the top of the plan, and um, the, the other blue area, uh, 31, sort of in the middle of the plan there, is, is a double height space uh, for the living space. Uh, and if we go up then to the plan on the right there, that's the top floor plan, uh, where we go up again to a top floor studio space. Um, this is the cross section through the existing house uh, with the double height um, living space running up through the middle there to, to top lighting uh, and the ash tree to the right at the rear, the unbuilt sun space at the right of the, uh, of the drawing. Um, and uh, this is the front elevation. So I hope what you can see here is the, uh, on the left, the um, existing house, which is there dates from circa 1890. So it's quite a lot bigger than the more humble house in the middle of the, the drawing, which is the 1840s house I've seen you, uh, I've shown you earlier. So the pitched roof there, the, the mono pitched roof um, is where our solar panels are. And that needed to go up to the same level as our neighbor on the left so that we could see the sun over that bigger house. That left me the architectural problem as to how to mediate between that big wedge-shaped space uh, on the left and the much smaller 
1840 house on the right. And that's where the, um, the dormer window element, which projects, came in to sort of uh, help to mediate uh, between the two. And that dormer element is, is sort of, uh, is inspired, if you like, by a number of the different quite rich arts and crafts, local um, roofscapes around, uh, which are picked up in, in the new building. Uh, both on the roof, the projecting dormer window with the curve on it there, which, as you've seen from the plans, picks up the curve of, of the staircase, uh, the little oriel window on, on the front, uh, which is uh, which is shown here looking up from, from below. So um, if we start to take a little walk around the house, um, we, we, we approach it from the street side and you can see um, in 3D here now how those drawings have manifested with the, uh, the dormer projecting um, on the right hand shot uh, and you'd be entering through the front door which is uh, on the right here uh, through one door uh, and inside you would find a second door made from this micon crystalline material which is a double skin material uh, so it's an insulating material but with a big chunky hemp rope handrail so I'm mixing up high-tech and low-tech materials if you like but wanting to make the point that um, we can use um, very low energy low embodied carbon materials to, um, to to create an architecture so uh, if we come through the plan this is the kitchen and dining room and as you've picked up from the plans this is narrower uh, at the far end of, of this shot the kitchen end uh, than um, behind me if, as if I'm taking this photo. And that's because the glazing to the right here, which looks out on the garden, uh, has been turned around uh, about 10 degrees. Uh, so it sees the sun, the, south, uh, the, the southerly sun um, for um, summer, uh, for, for winter heat gain. It sees that sun about an hour or an hour and a half earlier than it otherwise would. Uh, you can see the red brick here very much retained as part of the uh, as, as part of the character of the interiors and the existing building. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the wedge-shaped table echoing the wedge-shaped space and even the wedge-shaped uh, shelves where we've had some fun uh, with the architectural um, shapes and so forth. Uh, so th this is looking the other way down the dining room uh, with, with the reflected sunlight um, coming in. There are a number of mirrors which are used through the house to intensify the sunlight as it comes in. Uh, if we go down um, sort of a little bit further back in the house, this is the double height living space. Uh, the top lighting here, I think, is very important. Um, this would otherwise be the darkest part of the house, this, this central part. Um, but with the, um, with the top lighting, one unit of glass um, facing the sky, you may be aware, gives about five times, up to five times more light than, than one unit of glass facing out as, as a window, which sees um, a, um, a less bright part of the sky and trees and that sort of thing getting in the way. So top light is good. Um, each unit of light you get uh, has less heat loss associated with it and more light coming in. Therefore, that has led to the sort of verticality of spaces which I've um, exploited in, in this house. Uh, you can see as well the shutters which, which open to give different rooms their own characters and those shutters can be either opened or closed to make the rooms what I like to think of as extrovert or introvert. Um, but also to help with the summer nighttime cooling and also uh, um, acoustic separation or open plan. Um, a word about the wood burning stove, which is prominent in the right hand shot there. I think this is one of the few things which I would do differently with with the house uh, if I were doing it from scratch again. I think all, although it's a very, very highly efficient stove um, certified for use in, in um, smokeless zones and so forth, I think we know more about the NOx emissions and those sorts of things. Uh, um, and particulate matter and so forth than when, when I was specifying this, where I was really looking for um, a zero carbon source for, for the top up heat, uh, which the house would need. But secondly, I wouldn't do it again because we hardly need it. I think even in the coldest winters uh, that we've lived through over the past 14 years, we've only needed to light the wood burning stove for a few hours um, when the solar panels are covered in snow and just for, you know, a few hours, perhaps every two or three days and so forth. So uh, it's um, I, because we didn't know at the time we, we, we designed it, uh, whether we would even need a, um, a gas boiler to, to, um, to, to make the house fly. Uh, but we, we, we don't really even need the wood burning stove, um, I'm pleased to say. Um, so uh, but this is that double height space now looking up. 
uh, and um, the, the different qualities of sunlight reflected from the mirrors um, which line the roof light there at different times of different times of day and different times of year. Uh, and you may notice the quality of the light reflected is, um, it is from a very thin mirror material, which I purposely specified so that it was impossible to lay it completely flat. And that meant that the quality of the reflected sunlight has more, um, more similarities to the quality of light reflected from a pool of water, perhaps, uh, an animation of that light. Uh, and the sunlight, of course, is important, not just in terms of giving light and um, uh, effect and so forth, but because where the sunlight is reflected, and the house relies on passive solar gain for a, a good chunk of its heating, then um, that reflected light means that parts of the house which can't see the sunlight normally because they face the wrong way actually are, are then exposed to direct sunlight and that uh, intensifies the house's um, characteristic in storing the, the heat. Um, this is the sunlight um, uh, in, in March, so this is a few years ago, but this sort of month where you can see on the right there the very low uh, light coming in at, at 5 p.m. in March, so that, that that low light, and particularly in winter as well, means that the, um, the, the very heavy construction of the house, and you can see in this shot the heavy existing brickwork, uh, the, the, the heavy clay floors of which more along and on, um, and the, uh, the new walls and the old walls, all are heavy construction. And so that means very high thermal mass, and at this time of year, uh, storing that heat, um, daytime solar gains, uh, which are stored and then re-radiated at night, uh, but also in the winter, uh, uh, sorry, that's in the winter, but also in the summer, um, smoothing out the um, excess heat gains so that the house warms up slowly in, in summer. Uh, this is a little bit of the materiality in the way that sunlight manifests and reflects around the house, different, uh, different flooring materials here, the earth floor, the um, maple and, and the bathroom. Uh, the, the mirrors uh, uh, I've used um, perhaps playfully in some other areas to um, give a slightly surreal experience. Um, and um, in, the, um, in the bathroom itself, um, the, the, the mirrors are again used to, to funnel light in uh, the, the south facing bathroom uh, and to give re reflections um, which funnel that light right back into the house and the passive solar gains. Uh, the bath is surrounded by pebbles with much lower embodied carbon than, uh, than any other material I could, I could think of. Uh, and if we go up to the top floor, up, up these stairs, uh, where we've got, again, top lighting coming through the stairs, uh, then uh, we find ourselves in the top floor studio. Uh, this is the inside of the, uh, the dormer window, if you like, the window seat with uh, March sunlight. Um, if you step into that window, um, then this is the view back to your left, which you get back to, uh, to, to Birmingham city centre from the top floor, which I didn't quite know if that view would exist until we built the house, but uh, it's, it's a fantastic view. Um, and uh, this is then looking back into the rest of the space uh, with the solar roof above your head. Uh, and the, um, the, the windows there purposefully looking up into the ash tree, those two windows on, on the end. Uh, on the end gable elevation here. Uh, and you can see, because this room is, is, is unfurnished in this shot anyway, you can see more clearly the qualities of the, uh, of the earth flooring, which runs right through, through the house, uh, both the new and the old parts. Um, so I've walked you around the house. Uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the technical details now. Um, so this is the um, th this is a detail both of the um, existing and the new um, construction, which, which are very similar. Uh, so we've got uh, this is an intermediate floor uh, coming in with with the clay floor um, on top of a timber um, structure, and the um, the in, in pink there the masonry in, in some cases um, existing masonry. Uh, but in this case, th th this is the hydraulically compressed clay blocks, which we've constructed the house out of. So we've, we've avoided um, bricks, um, we've avoided concrete, uh, and we've gone for a much lower embodied carbon unfired clay block, uh, which as soon as it's, um, as soon as it's plastered and, and built in um, is, um, is, is perfectly weather resistant and so forth, but then externally insulated with rendered insulation on the outside. Um, and I'm pleased to say this was the first 
time in the UK that this particular system had been used without any mechanical fixings through the insulation. So uh, it's it's just adhered and pinned in place uh, the, the insulation materials. Uh, and then the pins are removed, so there are no stainless steel or other fixings which which go through it. Um, the red line that's showing the airtightness line just coming around the inside of the, the floor joists there. This is the insulation when it arrived. There was a, a lot of it, uh, material called Neopore, giving us a new value to the walls of uh, 0.11. Uh, and bottom shot there, um, Stuart is, is busy rendering the, uh, the insulation. Um, this is the detail where the existing house um, is insulated on the inside, uh, the, the, the wall. So you will have noticed from the shots at the front that the existing house, I didn't want to insulate on the outside. Uh, this isn't a, a conservation area, it's not a listed building. Uh, and um, it, we, we salute um, the ACAN, Chris Proctor's great work in, in the ACAN conservation area toolkit. But I, what I wanted to do was, was, to, uh, was to experiment with the idea that even, even though this isn't a particularly historic building, nevertheless, the outside has some architectural features, some, some character, and I wanted to keep that and therefore to insulate on the inside. So this, uh, this has a ventilated cavity and then warm cell um, 500 uh, cellulose insulation, giving the, uh, giving the internal lining to the wall there and uh, going right through across the floor there, as, as you can see. Um, if, we, if we look at the, uh, the roof, and this is the roof of the, um, of the new construction, uh, there are timber I-beams, 400 millimetre deep timber I-beams, with then 100 millimetres of wood fibre insulation above them, uh, membrane and solar panels, and we've met the wall construction before. Uh, the dotted line shows where the solar uh, technology from the roof comes down internally. Uh, and these are the solar panels. Uh, we had um, uh, we have 35 square meters of, of PV, uh, but also uh, about eight meters of solar thermal tubes um, providing hot water. So hot water and electricity, and I'll give you the carbon and other figures on that. But suffice it to say at this stage that the figures from 2010 to 11 have been replicated almost every year that we've got 147% uh, or 140 or sometimes a little bit less than that, but around 140% of our energy. So all our own energy. Uh, use is, is covered plus another 40 percent. Um, this is a detail of, of the triple glazed windows which we used. Uh, outside is on the right, inside is on the left. So um, uh, the, the, um, the insulation wraps over the face of the window so that you only see about 20 millimeters of window frame on the outside. That means you, we've got a very crisp, um, minimal architectural line, but also we have much less heat loss through the frame. And of course, at, at this level of construction, uh, we're not um, we're, we're losing much more heat through the frame itself. The frame is the cold bridge rather than the uh, the, the glazing. Uh, this is this is how those windows uh, went in on site on, on the left there, and on the right you can see the shot where you, you're just seeing that very slim twenty millimeters of uh, of grey external frame. Uh, you can also see on that particular window that I've carved back. The, um, the lining of the window so that um, in, this, in this case, the sun coming from the right on that shot will enter that window uh, much earlier than it would if, if, there were a, um, if there were a right angle reveal to that, um, to, to that window. So I've played around with, with the angles, both for architectural effect, but also, uh, but, but also based on the uh, climate um, science to, to maximize um, sun penetration. Um, this is a 3D of the heat recovery ventilation, which I think is now um, much more mainstream in terms of passive house. Anyone who's been involved with the passive house scheme will will have come across this, but uh, it was um, uh, it, it was not um, mainstream at all when when we were doing this. But the um, the warm and humid air is extracted through the red ducts from the kitchen and the bathroom area preheats the um, the incoming air which is then supplied through the through the blue ducts um, through um, 100 millimeter ducts mainly as on the right of the shot there uh, to, to the habitable rooms uh, and um, air tightness again was in its infancy when when I was designing this and um, those of you who know Niall Crossan in, in the top 
sort of left hand shot there, I had to import all the Intello membranes and grommets and so forth, which I hope everyone on the call is, is familiar with, if not check out in Intello membranes and um, the ecological building store amongst others. But uh, Niall very kindly flew over from, from Dublin to do a toolbox talk to our whole site um crew who, who are in the in the shot uh, there uh, to introduce them to the tapes how you how you applied them and so forth and i've i found that a hugely valuable lesson and i think with any building that has um uh, is, is looking to try and push the boundaries or, or do something radically low energy i would um, strongly encourage people to uh, to do those toolbox toolbox talks on site so that people understand why they're doing air tightness how to do it all the little intricacies uh, can be unpacked and, and talked through. And that was a very valuable uh, lesson for me in, in the importance of doing that. Uh, and on the shot on the right there, the grommets are already in place around, in that case, electrical cables coming through so that they can be um, secured back to the airtight membrane, the Intello membrane, uh, as, the, as the construction completes. Um, so that's a few elements of the of the technology of the building. So what has the monitoring and research shown? Uh, and um, um, again, credit to uh, Professor Lubo Yankovic, um, who was formerly at the Birmingham School of Architecture, now at Hertfordshire, uh, and uh, running Zero Carbon Hub. And um, this is uh, data extracted from a paper which which he and I did a couple of years ago, looking at the operational energy and the embodied carbon of the scheme. So um, the table at the top there, uh, we, we've got the, um, the, the UK Part L building regulations in, in 2021 would require you to, to have um, a, a, an operational energy use of, of better than 120 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Uh, passive house or, or the classic passive house standard, I, sh I should say, is uh, says better than 60 kilowatt hours. Uh, per square meter per year, passive house plus those who may be familiar with that is 45. Uh, the RIBA Climate Challenge 2030 standard and the LETI standard are more ambitious, uh, saying that we should get to better than 35 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that measured and monitored over these 14 years, the zero carbon house has been operating at around 34 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So that's the that's the energy used in the house. And I think um, aside from um, whether that whether that energy comes from a renewable resource or, or not, I think this is the key metric we should all be now focusing on is the operational energy use intensity. Uh, I, I think it's important to recognise that as the grid decarbonises now, by if if we're to believe that the current government's programme that uh, by 2035 the grid will be pretty much decarbonised, that would allow. Uh, anyone who is operating their building on 100% electricity to say, oh, well, this building is zero carbon uh, in operation, even if it was guzzling a huge amount of energy, which is clearly not right. And I, I think we need to be very careful of the way these things are described. And therefore, the, the operational energy use, I think, is, is the key metric. And if that energy use, um, in our case, 34 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, can then be offset by renewables, either on the site or somewhere else, then that can take it to, to zero carbon. But if that operational energy use is, is 120 or 200 or whatever kilowatt hours per square meter, I think it becomes crazy to start to try and meet all of that with, with renewables when one needs to reduce first. Um, so I just want to sort of put that in the context of, you know, zero carbon is, is an interesting concept, um, but, uh, and it has its uses, but it also uh, has its, um, uh, has its weaknesses, which we need to be very cognizant of. Um, when we come to embodied carbon, I think um, perhaps the position is clearer that if we, if we measure the embodied carbon emissions, uh, according to the RICS um, uh, methodology, uh, which looks at um, a, uh, RICS stages A to C, and um, which is to end of year life, uh, end of life at 60 years. Uh, and the RIBA uh, w w is, is saying one should be better than 625 kgs of CO2 per square meter uh, per year. Well, this was partly a retrofit, uh, partly new build, but uh, we've got 314 uh, kgs of CO2, uh, which, which I think partly um, relate, represents the fact that we've used a lot of very, very low carbon materials 
and I'll show you which are and which aren't in, in a moment, but also reflects the fact that um, the house is um, around um, around 50 percent of it is, is retrofit. And I think I'd just give a plug for an interesting document which Letty put out recently, which gives you the sort of methodology for, for weighing up retrofit against uh, against new build and uh, how those might be looked at, which, of course, is very um, uh, much the fore at the moment as we await perhaps next month the result of the Marks and Spencer's embodied carbon uh, planning um, inquiry uh, and and see what uh, what comes of that. So anyway, th 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 that was the headline data from the, the research. Uh, if we look at that um, it, it, through a different lens, if if we look at the heating which the old house required, so that's the smaller house before we extended it, the heating in, in the old house before the work. Uh, required around 160 um, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. The heating in the retrofit, amazingly, to my mind anyway, uh, is only requires 7.3 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And that's the same metric where Passive House would want you to be below 15. Uh, but we're we're around half of that, so it's it's a 95 percent reduction on the the, um, the the heating which the which, which the house needed before we did this um, deep retrofit work. Uh, and if we look at the broader metric of the energy use intensity of all household uses, that in the old house was around 240, and we've got uh, around an 86 percent reduction now to this um, 34 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which uh, which I mentioned to you before. If we look at the embodied carbon, uh, we've got um, uh, the, the research paper, which which I flagged, has, has got a whole lot of different uh, data in it, which um, uh, Lubo Yankovic, all, all credit to him for doing the uh, uh, doing the analysis here. But these these are the bigger elements. Um, the, the windows, understandably, perhaps the, the clay blocks, because there are quite a lot of them. The neopore is, is the insulation, which is. Um, uh, is, is quite high, uh, but then the solar thermal and the solar PV are, are big elements um, uh, from this total um, uh, material carbon budget of of, um, uh, of 39 odd, um, 39 K kgs of, of CO2. And if, if we look at that in another way, um, the embodied carbon is, is the 39, uh, um, 39,000. The construction processes were only about 3% of the total embodied carbon. Then maintenance, which is factored in, uh, those who are familiar with the RICS methodology at, um, uh, at, at different uh, stages through, through the life cycle, replacement of electrics, uh, in, in this case, um, replacement of other services and so forth, uh, and then end of life. Uh, so the whole thing totals around 64,000 kgs of CO2. Um, uh, to, to get to the 100 percent there, and of the um, of, of the embodied carbon, 62 percent of it is in the materials on on this house, uh, and uh, big chunks, 32 percent of 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 the of the um, embodied carbon is just in the PV solar, and we looked at um, an analysis of obviously the solar uh, PV is, is generating energy, and it's generated. Um, enough energy uh, uh, to displace the carbon for its own creation in, in seven and a bit years. Uh, by contrast, the solar thermal has um, paid for itself in, in, in carbon terms in only three years. So perhaps we should be looking more at uh, solar thermal than uh, people have been um, in, in recent years. Um, that's enough about the research and, and the technicalities. Uh, to talk about the low carbon architecture then briefly, uh, I've spoken briefly about the rammed earth floors which, which run through the house. We dug up um, good Birmingham red clay from the foundations of the house. Uh, we sieved it to 10 millimetres and we then have used it to create 75 millimetre thick screeds uh, through the um, through the house. Uh, I, was, um, I discovered sort of the earth based materials partly through working on this house when I was at Associated Architects, uh, th th this um, so-called eco house in, in, in Worcester, uh, which um, was, um, uh, was extremely low, low energy at, at the time, won the RIBA Sustainability Award um, a number of years ago, um, solar there, a passive solar gain. Uh, but I was very interested to use the, um, use the cob walling as, as the, um, uh, as an earth-based material, ultra low carbon. And so on this house, uh, I took that further by, by doing these earth floors. So the sieved earth is, is top right there, uh, a happy chap laying the floor on the uh, uh, 
top top right um an early experiment where the floor cracked a little bit too much um bottom left uh and the clay block wall um in construction bottom right there but um as as we then after the sample we we perfected the mix and, and kept the um uh, kept the matrix much drier so that there was less cracking uh, and these are the figures, comparative figures, which I did, in fact, based on the Cobton house, which which I've shown you, the the, 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 um, the house with the earth wall, that if we said the embodied energy in the materials, embodied carbon, I should say, uh, of, of the cob is, is one. Uh, by, com by contrast, timber would be 40, steel 2,000, aluminium 5.5K, and plastics up to 9,000 times. So I'm not saying you can build... 9,000 houses um, from earth-based materials for the carbon budget of, of just one. But I think these differentials are not sort of, not factors of, of one or one and a half or whatever, that they're very, very significant differentials um, in, in terms of looking at um, ultra low carbon embodied materials. Uh, and we followed that through um, in terms of low carbon architecture, if you like, with the uh, reclaimed timber, all the timber I've showed you in the shots earlier is, is uh, was a factory floor not far from here. It's Canadian reclaimed honeydew maple. Um, the uh, All the door handles are, Arn Jacobson's wonderful design classic uh, in, in brass, uh, all reclaimed. The lime plaster used through the house uh, has a recycled glass aggregate in it, as you can see from the sort of uh, the twinkling on the right of the shot there to, to displace the sand which would otherwise be needed uh, and the quarrying. Uh, so that's part of the sort of circular economy thing. Um, this is uh, top right is, is Eddie Gallagher, sadly died. Um, of cancer a couple of years ago, but he's holding on the right the um, the, the, the um, unreclaimed or, or the sort of unsanded, I should say, uh, um, maple, and then on the left one of the stairs, which is which is sanded down and made from the uh, from the maple. So I think the quality of reclaimed materials I would like to 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 propose as an interesting ingredient in uh, creating a low carbon architecture. Uh, and I've shown you already the rope handrails, which were used on the front door. They're used on the stairs there. And uh, hemp um, is a very fast growing plant. It requires no pesticides. Uh, and uh, so it locks up carbon. And I think we need to rethink the way we look at um, materials um, so that those materials which are ultra low carbon become attracted to us and those which are uh, uh, ultra high embodied carbon become become sort of uh, you know beauty is in the eye of the beholder if you like but I, I think if one sees those materials as pretty abhorrent the high carbon materials then one is is looking for uh, an alternative um, here is the um, the view from the garden, um, the, the southwest, and the dusk shot shows you perhaps the uh, the old house, the brickwork wrapped up inside the new house there, uh, and the ash tree uh, hovering over it. I haven't described in detail, but there's a very important symbiotic function which the ash tree has. Uh, it provides um, solar shading, seasonal solar shading. So the low winter sun, as you perhaps can see from this shot and some of the shots I've showed earlier, penetrates in through the windows um, at a very shallow angle, 12 degrees, as we know, in, in midwinter, uh, coming up to 45 degrees at the um, spring equinox, which was just a couple of days ago. Uh, but then by the time we get to, uh, and so the leaves are off the tree um, at, at, at that sort of time of year, by the time we get to high summer and the sun up at 62 degrees, uh, the, the fact that that tree sort of sp sprawls across the whole of that south elevation up at high level means that we get around 80% shading of the substantial areas of glass there, which is uh, very important to, to prevent summer overheating, but it doesn't need any blinds, motorized aluminium louvers or any other high tech wizardry just to um, uh, just using the natural fact that the um, the ash tree responds to the um, the seasons to provide that shading just exactly when we when we need it. Um, this is the, uh, the the inside of the top floor space um, looking back the other way to, towards the staircase. Um, these are some of the awards which um, uh, were generously mentioned at, at the start of the the 
presentation by George's introduction. But I think the, uh, the, the thing that many visitors comment on is, is the quality of light in the house uh, and the quality of light reflected from these, these mirrors. So this is uh, in the staircase with, with the light cascading down. Um, and I just want as a, as a little coda to sort of move into uh, as a final sort of segue into just a, a, a little vignette of the work we're doing at Retrofit Balsall Heath. Uh, and this is partly because um, in the stated um, uh, ACAN aims, I think uh, working in communities, working for change and so forth is very much part of what um, what ACAN is about and is very much what we've, uh, you know, partly why we built the zero carbon house was, you know, it's attracted a lot of visitors from, uh, from all around the place, but uh, it, it's attracted a lot of local interest. And uh, we formed this group about 18 months ago to look at retrofitting the whole of Balsall Heath. Uh, and uh, we held the Retrofit Reimagined Festival, um, partly at the Zero Carbon House uh, and partly with Civic Square over in, in uh, Ladywood, uh, just um, uh, North Birmingham. So it was a collaboration between myself and Retrofit Balsall Heath, but with Civic Square, with ACAN, with uh, Dark Matter Labs in London, and um, initially with the New Economics Foundation, uh, which we held um, in July last year. This is this is Balsall Heath, a pretty dense, um, uh, de densely populated uh, bit of multicultural inner city in Birmingham. Uh, the Red Stars are streets which don't actually have a road on them; they're just accessed by by footpaths. Uh, and a lot of this um, narrow frontage, four meter frontage. Um, uh, terraced housing of, of this type uh, and um, people may know Balsall Heath is for, uh, perhaps famous for the Balti Triangle for UB40 um, and other things but uh, we've also got the um, the first um, mosque run vaccination center COVID vaccination center in in, uh, in the country the first solar church in Birmingham and the Bahu Trust uh, have been UN observers at many of the climate summit so this is one of our other other mosques so although sadly we've had the worst covid deaths in birmingham uh, in balsall heath uh, i like to think in a very biased way we have the best community spirit in birmingham uh, as evidenced by this balsall heath nature map and we've tried to put into practice these graphics again credit to the fantastic team at um, at Civic Square, who put this together as part of the, the festival collaboration. But uh, the, the notion of moving from individual customers to neighborhood collectives, that's what we're trying to do in Balsall Heath to organize as, as a community group. Uh, instead of working house by house, where you know this funding pot, LADS 3 or whatever, will do this, social housing decarbonization will do that just house by house, but to look at street by street as a living system. And we've had fantastic success in some roads where we've got 90% of the, of the road have, have signed up to do retrofit, which we'll need to look at over a number of years with different uh, parts of funding uh, and moving, we hope, from a short term campaign to a long term vision um, and uh, from a centralised system to, to a distributive one where we've got a sort of little local hub, if you like, um, as um, and, and there are other pioneers of, of this, like, like uh, People Powered Retrofit uh, up in um, up in Manchester do, doing doing great stuff. Um, so uh, we, we've been doing 700 homes um, to start Retrofit. Uh, we've, we've got community developed leaflets and messaging, um, and we've been looking at street champions at um, urban agriculture, at food, at biodiversity, um, and community finance models. But I think the key concept, what we're doing with Balsall Heath Retrofit, is that this is a community-led partnership. The community is not being consulted or involved by, by others, uh, but we want to, we're, we're holding out for the idea that the community actually helps to lead the partnership, co-lead the partnership, uh, 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 similar to the way People Powered Retrofit has been doing fantastic work in Manchester and the way that the Housing Action Trusts, perhaps 20 or more years ago, was set up with very strong resident involvement. Uh, these are just uh, um, the many different community organisations we've been liaising with. Uh, and there's even some of you may have come across uh, Simeon's fantastic board game, Climania, a board game developed with local six formers, all about retrofitting Balsall Heath. Uh, so it's it's a fantastic, vibrant group to, doing lots of things. Um, and um, we've, we've got the... Um, uh, the, the, the ACAN uh, input into natural building materials as, as well here, which we're trying to advocate in, in Balsall Heath. Um, so finally, 
Uh, I think, sorry, we've got to repeat there. Uh, finally, at the launch of Retrofit Balsal Heath, uh, Sheikh Nuru, um, one of our local mosque leaders said, when we come together as a community, we can take this to the next level, not if, but when we come together. Uh, and um, finally, I, I think um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and hand back to George for any uh, any questions. Well, thank you very much, John. I think if we were perhaps all in a room together, you'd be a, have a big round of applause. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, George. <laughs> so, so we've got about 15 minutes or so um, left for questions. Um, if anyone has any more questions, then and is already in the chat, please drop them in. But um, I think we'll start with Sarah's um, question, which is, uh, has the real life performance of the building been better than you've expected? Well, it definitely has, Sarah. I think um, when, when we started out, I've, I've alluded perhaps briefly to it, but um, the um, Passive House PHPP software was, was, was new in the country. No one had done a passive house scheme. None of the computer modeling programs which were around by leading practitioners could, could tell us whether this house was going to work. Uh, and so in, in the basement, I put in space and, and there's the space for a gas boiler flue to, to come right through, through the building. We didn't quite dare hope. And if I'd been doing it for another client, I, I, I would have had to caveat it very, very severely, but doing it for oneself, one's perhaps able to take more risks um, and uh, be cognizant of a plan B if, if they don't work. But the house, we, we were hoping that the house um, with the following wind, the new part of the house would perform to zero carbon standards. In other words, the, the, the renewables on, on the roof and so forth would generate um, enough energy to, to offset the energy use. We really didn't know if, if that was going to be um, possible on the, on the old part of the house, um, the, the, the retrofit part. But the, uh, I've given you some of the measured and monitored data um, already, and um, you can see that it, um, perhaps from, from, from the data I've given, that it's performed much better than we had, we had dared hope. And in fact, we've misnamed the house, haven't we? Because it's not zero carbon house. It's, uh, we don't really have the vocabulary for better than zero carbon. Is, does that become carbon negative? I like to say better than zero carbon, but uh, yes, no, it's, it's certainly performed and continues to perform. Um, much better than we had uh, we we had imagined. So uh, yes, great. Thanks, John. Um, I'll jump to the next question from Bobby, which is: Given the need for nationwide mass retrofit, what's the one element from zero carbon house that every home in the UK could or should have? Well, interesting question. Uh, if one had to have one element, but uh, I I, su I suppose the key thing is is to have. Uh, a, a complete envelope um, of, of insulation. I, I think the, re the renewables come further further down the list, but I think the um, the, the air tightness and the continuity of, of insulation, I would say, is is, is the sort of is, is one of the lessons from this. But I think if we can make sure that the retrofit we do as part of this generation doesn't just say, oh well, you know, we've got some money to do the windows, but sorry, we haven't got enough to do the walls, or um, you know, perhaps we can do the on a good day we can do the loft and the um, and the walls and the windows. Um, but we have to leave out the floors. Uh, but I, I think what we found is that um, uh, uh, one needs to be pretty obsessive. I think is would 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 be would be my advice that we've got um, one of the elements in in the house here is is the is the front door lock, which um, is a cylinder lock which goes from inside to outside. And going around the detailing of of the house, you know, I was pretty pretty ruthless in designing out all the cold bridges I could but that little that little lock is always the part which gets condensation on it and that's a little microcosm if you like as to if if we if we only partially retrofit our homes at this time or if we only put in um, if we only put in 50 mil of insulation when in fact we should be putting in 150 I think the overheads the, the, the scaffolding the um, the the, um, the site work and so forth is, is is pretty much the same if one if one is putting in insulation at this thickness or, or this thickness and I think I, I would say you know it, the one thing we need to do is is to just make sure we do the whole house and we do it once properly now and we don't come back in 20 years to say oh well you know what a shame we we didn't do this properly and we have to rip it all out and start again so i think go go the whole way is, is the one thing i i would say in terms of the 
the envelope, the firm, you know, fabric first, but, you know, th th let's make sure that it's a fabric that we never have to come back to again, rather than one that we, uh, uh, we, we find we've done inadequately. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Just just, a, shall, I, shall I stop the sheen, screen sharing now? I don't I think. You, you, um, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, we, you, you've got on, on the slide here, you've got the zero carbon house website. And oh, yes, at the bottom, I should just give a plug for the Zero Ambitions podcast, um, which is hosted by Best. Uh, but there's there's one on retrofit Balsall Heath, which I've uh, I've done recently, but uh, there are others coming up on that. So that's well worth uh, checking out and, and publicising. Uh, I'll stop sharing. I think um, Lubo Jankovic has his hand up, hand raised, if you'd like to join us. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, um, I, I, I've just, uh, I'd like to add something to what John has said. I've had the privilege of working with John for many years now. Uh, the on... privilege has been mine, Lubo. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to give you uh, an example of um, uh, the level of detail that John has gone into, uh, on, a, on, a, on one very cold uh, winter day, I came round with a thermal camera to look uh, uh, inside and outside of the house uh, with, with John. And we noticed uh, a cold bridge uh, well, in, in, in one area. And uh, uh, when we took uh, our views off the camera, I looked at what it was, it was insulation missing on the hinge, believe you or not, of, of the door. So John had that uh, uh, fixed uh, afterwards, but this is the level of detail that uh, John has gone into. Uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, um, making uh, the house well insulated and protected from elements. Thank you, Lubo. Yes, and in fact, it, it, it was the air st airtight strip on that hinge you, you remind me of. And in fact, it, it was a door that had two airtight seals and we, we'd only we got one airtight seal, which was continuous, but another, the second airtight seal is the only bit that was missing. So I think that very interesting point that your scientific mind should, should pick up. But I think it very much reinforces the point that if, if, we, if we do a partial retrofit and we leave gaps, then those gaps can become catastrophic and we really need to be obsessive in, uh, in, in, in the detail. So uh, thank you for that. And I, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to the, the, the figures I've, I've uh, presented, which were our joint research on carbon and so forth, Lupo. A couple, a couple of uh, uh, anecdotal examples. Uh, not, not, yeah, one of the figures, one of the um, issues we found, uh, we, we've modeled uh, uh, the house, we've done uh, uh, dynamic simulation modeling of the house extensively. And uh, uh, having established that it was carbon negative, I wanted to see what would happen if we change the location of the house in terms of uh, uh, geometry, in terms of geographic location and weather data to uh, Rovaniemi in Finland, which is just inside the Arctic Circle. And it was actually still performing at, at a carbon negative level, uh, not as, as much as, as uh, in Birmingham, but it was still good enough. Uh, another anecdote, um, uh, I, I was I, I came across was then when we were installing our instruments to monitor the house uh, back in the early days that must have been 2010 and uh, <clears throat> somebody from British Gas came while I was there on site uh, to talk to John uh, about why uh, the building had been disconnected from the gas supply a year before and never connected again and he, he was looking around thinking that maybe you know, uh, John <laughs> is stealing gas uh, for, in, in some way, but of course he couldn't care less about uh, gas because he was uh, cooking on electricity and, uh, and uh, uh, everything was coming from the sky. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your comments. It's uh, nice to hear about your collaboration a bit more. I'm sure everyone else would say the same as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> moving on to some of the questions, we've, we've got about eight minutes um, left to go. Um, one from Yulia, which is uh, how supportive were other disciplines such as planners during the early stages of the project? Well, good question. Thank you. And um, we, we, we had very supportive people from from the planners in, in Birmingham. I think it's partly um, it, it's partly a reflection of the consultation that, that we did beforehand, uh, where we put up um, 
uh, all my drawings of the house and my son Theo, who was uh, aged only, I think, about four at the time, we, we put up his drawings as to what he would like the house to be. And we, we, we had a, an open day with, with lots of um, local visitors who came around. Uh, and the um, which, in fact, we then uh, grew into a whole series of, of, of open days during the construction. So I think we had about eight different um, open mornings on a Saturday morning where people could come and see how the construction was progressing, see what the materials were like and so forth. And that seemed to snowball in the early days of Twitter into people coming from London and Wales and all over the place to, to see it. But the um, that that first um, that first sort of open event before the house was put in for planning permission uh, resulted in um, uh, people uh, people sort of quizzically asking, you know, well, will this really happen? Uh, uh, what will it be like, John? But uh, very kindly then writing in such that the planners said this is the only application of this type we've, we've ever known where we've only had letters of support in terms of the, the application. <laughs> but I think in terms of um, in terms of other uh, other disciplines, I was I was working with uh, Richard Hartzorn at, at Shire Consulting, who was very positive on the uh, on, on the um, structural side uh, and um, Matthew Hill, who's sadly now died at, at LEADA, Leeds Environmental Design Associates, who, who was looking at all the different computer models which were around at the time uh, and really judging the models by what results they gave um, uh, gave on the house. And we were just comparing, you know, well, this model says this, this model says this, we don't quite believe this or that. So uh, the, the, the team were very important and, you know, as important, I think local residents, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, when I was just finishing the house, um, th there was a local person who I hadn't met. I, I lived sort of the other side of Balsall Heath up until moving here, uh, who, who was walking up the road carrying two very heavy shopping bags and she put them down. She looked at me and I looked at her and she said, is this anything to do with you? And um, one is not always, uh, as a modern architect, one's used to receiving brick bats sometimes. So I said, yes, you know, I've designed it and it's my, uh, it's going to be our, our family home. Uh, what what do you think? Uh, and she said, oh, well, you know, I'm very much in favour of it. To see something like this happening around here, it gives it, it gives us all hope, she said. So I, I hope that I hope that that hope is, is something that with the retrofit fossil heath work we're, we're building on in the community. And, you know, it's it's uh, the ambition was always that this shouldn't just be one uh, zero carbon house, if you want to call it that, in Balsall Heath, but we should we should uh, be looking to, um, as, as the time said, uh, to, to look at what the future could, could be like for all of us. Amazing. Sounds like uh, everybody loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps um, those who those who don't are too polite to say so to me. But <laughs> uh, we've got a, another question from Tamsin, which is: How do you think this level of the detail and scrutiny to each element can be applicable in common practice and larger scale developments, and or on lower budget projects with tighter timescales? Well, very good question, and I think you know I would be the first to say that this, this has been um, an experimental project, and I've sort of you know I, I've explored a whole lot of different agendas in terms of architecture, light, materials, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I wouldn't I wouldn't want it to be taken as as a blueprint, all of which could could be applied generally. But nevertheless, what are the parts that that can be applied? I think if we look at the fabric of of the old house, I think that's very readily applicable. That um, in order Order to you know it, it, above me in the, the room I'm sitting in I've got the old slates uh, and roofing felt and tiling battens and rafters of, of an 1840 house uh, perhaps it's been re-roofed re once in its life uh, and beneath that I've just slung down a light timber frame of, of two by two timbers uh, to, to make a void like this which is then pumped full of, of warm cell cellulose insulation which is very inexpensive very low uh, carbon footprint to it uh, and I think that there are elements like that that could be, uh, and I hope will be, and, and I hope are, be, are being in, in, in some areas of, of the retrofit community rolled out. And I think the other thing I, I would say is that I think many of the terraced houses of, of this and other industrialised cities were all built. Um, you know, 150 years ago to a pattern book. In Birmingham, they were then re retrofitted in the 80s to a pattern book. And I think if we can move from this being 
um, because it was a you know it was breaking a lot of new ground a sort of a, a, a one-off thing to a pattern book approach where you know many of these details are open source and I, I, if, if we can do that to, and, and have a sort of a standard way we can do things and particularly I think if we can do as we're trying to do with retrofit fossil heat as I've mentioned not just a house by house approach but a street by street approach where we've got the volume to do a whole terrace to put solar panels across it to put heat pumps in to do all the extra Internal wall insulation perhaps on the sides and the rears of the house and internal wall insulation on the front as, as we've done here so I think many of those elements can and, and must honestly be, be put uh, be put into practice at, uh, uh, at a larger scale and I think by doing it at a larger scale uh, that will bring the cost down and and as the skills come in and and the sort of you know the, 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 the volumes go up I think um, and particularly with with the statistics I was uh, I was looking I was looking at at the beginning of, of the talk and the, the, the um, figures from the um, uh, Committee for Climate Change are, are, are very clear and I think that the whole carbon budget of the UK would be blown just on heating existing houses alone without any uh, any further um, uh, industry transport etc so you know we have to do this work and I think we have to find a way that it can be done at scale but also we need to not lose sight of the fact that as many have said this is a matter of national infrastructure importance we need the government to to come up uh, and we need to treat it as we treat our, our roads, our, um, our, our Wi-Fi, um, our, our cable internet access and so forth, that we have to have houses which will be performing fit for the, the, the 21st century. Um, because the alternative is either do we knock them all down, do we condemn people to living in fuel poverty with the, all the health problems, uh, and, and other spiraling problems that we haven't got time to go into today, but we did a big piece on at the Retrofit Reimagined Festival. And so I think the multiple wins of Retrofit are, you know, on, on, on so many areas, jobs and skills, um, health, uh, community building, um, carbon emissions, et cetera, uh, that, that I think we can't afford not to do it, but we have to absolutely, Tamsin is quite right, to, to, find, to, to, to find ways of, of, of making it. Um, making it affordable. So anyway, I hope that's a few pointers uh, in answer to that very important question. Thank you, John. Um, and we are actually out of time now. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone who's, who's joined. Um, as, as Dan, do you have a small input towards the end, Lubo, um, as well? Um, thanks, John. And yeah, thanks everyone else for joining the call. Um, the, the call's been recorded, so we'll be uploading it to the ACAN YouTube um, as soon as possible. So, uh, good well, night, thank everyone. you very much, George, for hosting. Thank you for the HM team for, for the kind invitation. And I hope, you know, al although this is a bit of a, a pioneering project from 14 years ago, I, I hope there are still some lessons that are, that are as relevant now as, as they were when we were doing it. And uh, people can carry them forward into this, you know, this such an important time we're, we're living in, in terms of getting retrofit right. So thank you all very much for intelligent thank questions you. as Thanks, well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.